Um, but <laughs> this this is a top. This is a conversation about the LGBTQ plus stuff and the Bible and how to love our neighbors. So I have to give you a little bit more than just what I would answer with in you know a street conversation or something like that. Is okay. What does the Bible actually say? Because we need to know these kinds of things. Um, so there's. We'll start with LGB because that's kind of its own sexual orientation, who you're attracted to. is kind of its own thing. We'll talk about transgenderism later. Um, but there's two main um, sections of the Bible, Old Testament and New Testament. Surprisingly enough, Leviticus 2, 2013 is the only place in the Old Testament that we have this prohibition about, uh, against same-sex acts. Uh, we have more from the New Testament that is prohibiting that than we do from the Old Testament. Um, so before we move on with that, a, a common argument that we get in the church or, or, or that's leveled against us, an accusation is saying, well, you're just picking and choosing verses from the Bible to be homophobic. Um, you, you're using the Old Testament to say that you shouldn't um, engage in, in same-sex sex. Um, and then the, the follow-up to that will be, okay, do you eat bacon? Raise your hand if you have eaten bacon in your life and enjoyed it, um, as you should. Uh, right, like the Old Testament t- says you can't have pork. And so now we eat pork. So then they'll say, hey, aren't you picking and choosing what you want to do with your life? And that, that seems fair, Right. Um, but a good biblical, a principle for biblical interpretation would be if a command is repeated in the New Testament, then that Old Testament command is still binding for the Christian today. And notice I say for the Christian today, because these ethical commands are not binding, I believe, um, on people who aren't Christians. If you're not a part of the community, then we're not, we're not going to treat you with judgment. We're going to cre- treat you with love. That's how you come in. We'll judge you after you get in the church. Um, so Leviticus 20, 13 is repeated in the New Testament uh, more than it was in the Old Testament. And then another argument that comes up is Paul, when he wrote those three sections in the New Testament, he wasn't talking about the loving, committed same-sex marriages that we're talking about today. He was talking about something else, which was called pederasty. And this is a real argument that people have used. It's coming out of fashion now because scholars are starting to realize it's not actually that good of an argument. But um, pederasty was, was basically the, the practice of an older um, aristocratic man taking a slave boy, and that was the kind of relationship, which is horrible, right? Um, and, and people, you know, from the LGBTQ community will say, of course that's horrible. That's not what we're talking about. You know, we're, we're talking about these loving same-sex marriages. Well, the problem with that is that Paul was talking about the exact thing that we're talking about today. Um, in those passages, right, that we had just a second ago, of, in Romans 1, 26, 27 specifically, those two sections, he describes, he's like, men committing acts with men, women committing acts with women. He doesn't, and, and by the way, like, women relationships, that wasn't a thing of, like, wealthy aristocratic women taking slave girls. Like, that wasn't a thing for them in the first century. So, Paul, using language that spells out, like, exactly what he means of, like, yeah, no, just two men, two women. Like, that's not God's ideal. And, uh, and then, you know, the same kind of thing for 1 Corinthians 6, 9 and 1 Timothy 8, 11. Um, yeah, Paul does have these kinds of things in mind and is saying, nope, that's, that's not for the Christian. Um, it's funny, every time, okay, uh, I was just going to make a comment about this, but that's useless, so let's keep talking. <laughs> uh, another argument that comes up is, didn't God make me this way? Right, um, and and so one of the things that the LGP, LGB, it's it's so hard to say the community. Can we just say the community so I don't have to keep going through letters? Um, the that community, them, they uh, have have said um, basically kind of used a a civil rights kind of approach to getting more um, acceptance in in the broader culture, and in the same way that the civil rights movement was like. 
this is the color of our skin. We're born this way. God made us this way. Why are we being treated differently then? Why are you judging us this way? Well, then the same argument has come up then of this is how you're born. And so then if God made you this way, then you should act this way, right? Um, well, this is that researchers have been trying for years to figure out the biological component for same-sex attraction. It's never been found. So, and then that gets into the whole idea of, okay, is this, is this nurture versus nature? Um, and what I've found in the research that I've done is that is really unhelpful for parents, uh, the whole idea of nature versus nurture, especially households that are convinced that there is no nature part to this, when their kid ends up coming out, then they will put blame on themselves and say, I did something wrong as a parent. That's not, I don't think that's true. I don't think that parents do something wrong and they make their kid gay. I don't think that that's what happens. Um, let's see if this next slide gets... Okay, <laughs> we'll, we'll get into where I'm going with that in a second. But um, even if... I mean... Imagine being born that, like, is that actually a good argument for the morality of an action? Like, well, I'm born this way. Does that mean you can do it? Like, like imagine you're born and you're like, I'm a kleptomaniac. That was how I was born. I just like stealing stuff. That doesn't mean that you get to do that, right? Like, arguing from the way I was born doesn't mean that something is, an act is, is right. Um, you know, and I think to use that argument of born this way, therefore I have to act this way, um, actually does an, a severe injustice to the civil rights movement itself, right? Like, that sounds to me kind of racist. Like, if, because <laughs> couldn't we bring the argument back of saying, like, a white person has to act this way? Like, if, if you're white, you have to think that ketchup is spicy, you know, like, I don't think so. I don't think that that has to happen, you know, and then the same thing for, for African Americans. You're black, so you have to act this way. Like, I don't want to go down that path. Um, so let's, let's go back for a second because I wanted to touch on this, and maybe we'll get into the Q&A. But, um, yeah, just this idea of, like, if you're a parent and, and this ends up being your experience or, you know, younger kids, if, if you get older and you get married and this ends up being your experience, don't beat yourself up about this. Like, th this is not your doing. Um, I just wanted to make that clear, because a lot of parents end up beating themselves up and feeling lots of guilt and shame and all that. So uh, another question, though, is to, to say, what, where's the sin here? Um, and, and typically, when people talk about this specifically, church circles talk about this, we, we kind of paint too broad of a, of a stroke here of we'll, we'll kind of conflate, we'll, we'll put these two things together of same-sex attraction and sin. And I don't think that that's what we should do. I think we should say, like the Bible says, to engage in same-sex sex, that's sinful. But I don't think that the Old Testament or the New Testament teaches that same-sex attraction itself is sinful. Um, because then wouldn't heterosexuals, like, why, why would heterosexual attraction be sinful? Like, we try to even break those, those two things apart, attraction and lust. We try to break those up in, in the church to know which is good and which is bad, but then is it, okay, only, only heterosexual people can ha feel attraction? Like, if we know that lust is a next step, and we know that acting on it physically is another step, so I don't think that being same-sex attracted in itself is a sin. I think it's brokenness, but I don't think that it's sin. I think that, I think that our own, like, if you're heterosexual, there's brokenness there too, right? Like, we, we see it all over our society of how we take our attractions and we use it sinfully. 
right? And then, you know, some people are like, I really wish I wasn't attracted to so many people, you know, the opposite sex. It's like, okay, yeah, that might be, that might be nice, you know, might help a little bit. Um, so, to, in my mind, the way that the Bible talks leads me to believe to act sexually outside of the way that God designed it, that's what's sinful, but attraction itself isn't um, a sin. So then the question comes up, can you be a gay Christian? Now, I'm not going to get into the, debate, into the debate about whether or not you can use the label gay as a Christian. There's some people that say yes, there's some people uh, that say no, but what I'm thinking is that you can be same-sex attracted and follow Jesus. There are so many people who are same-sex attracted Christians who are choosing a life of celibacy voluntarily. And, and you know, we need more of that in the church because we need to hear this more often. You don't need sex to be happy. And we need to know that the church has been a part of the problem here, actually. Um, let's, yeah, so um, we'll talk about this more in depth, but there's this thing that is being commonly called purity culture now. It's, it's kind of looking back into Christian history and saying that, um, yeah, that's, that's called purity culture. And this is, this is the idea. The messaging around sex has been this. Sex is necessary in order to live a fulfilled life. Um, and then ideally, this sex would be had with a com within a committed loving relationship. Um, by the way, the Bible doesn't talk this way. <laughs> Like, if you know your Bibles, 1 Corinthians 7, that whole passage, like, a lot of that is saying, hey, uh, Paul, you know, I love Paul. He's great. This is just like, um, if, if you can, like, not get married, do that, <laughs> which is like, wait a minute. Like, aren't we told, like, get married? And then, and we're, you know, Paul's like, no, I, if you can avoid it, go for it. Like, and, and I think he acknowledges most people will probably end up getting married, you know, most people, like, we need to be okay with the Bible saying that normal is fine. <laughs> I think we make a lot of Christians guilty for not, you know, being street evangelists and stuff like that. Like, okay, it's fine to be normal. It's fine to get married. But Paul's also like, don't get married if you can, if you can not. Just throwing it out there because you might be more committed to God if you're not married. You know, and I love it. The way he talks about it is like, you're distracted. <laughs> Like you're distracted by your spouse. I'm like, yeah, that's, that's a fair critique. Uh, and, and, and two, in church history, after the Roman Empire kind of took Christian, Christianity on as its official religion, the early church, too, also erred on the side of, of encouraging singleness. Um, because one of the things that happened was before the Roman Empire made the Christianity its official religion, Rome had been persecuting Christians quite a bit. And so all those passages in the New Testament saying that you're going to be persecuted for your faith made sense. But now that Rome made this an official religion, people were like, where the heck did my persecution go? Like, I, I, need, to, I need to be persecuted. So they're like, well, no one's persecuting me, so I guess I'm going to make life miserable for myself. I'm, I'm going to do fasting a lot. I'm going to wear clothes that's, like, really coarse, and I'm going to go out into the desert, and I'm not going to get married. Like, so the early church was saying, man, not being married is a, a Christian, it's not for everybody, but it's a Christian ideal. And, and before the, the Reformation, this is really interesting, before the Reformation occurred, this was our system of thinking about um, status of women specifically. And a woman's status was like, if you're a wife with children, that's like at the bottom. Now, this is not me, okay? I'm not saying this myself. I'm just saying this is what the church used to think. And then in the middle was kind of, be, you have been married, you're a widow now, though, and, and now you're just really generous with your time and you take care of the saints. I think there's biblical evidence for that. And then at the top, if you were a holy virgin, that was the best thing that you could be as a woman in the church system. And what's interesting is that there's even like, um, we have to, undo the modern understanding of, of this word, but there was, there was like a, a transcending gender in, in that of, of being a holy virgin. So like women, if they were going to have leadership positions within the church, that's what they had to be, was a holy virgin. Because in their mind, what made, you know, this is probably not totally accurate, but in their mind it was um, like 
you are gendered if you are married because you have to have the marriage union, you know, consummated. So uh, their thought was like, well, you're basically not a guy or a girl if you just never have sex. It's, it's really interesting. But then after the Reformation happened, there was some, I think, good pushback, but it flipped the pyramid so that holy virgins were at the bottom, generous widows. They never got any more credit. <laughs> they just stayed where they were. And then if you were a wife with children, that was the best thing that you could be. And my thought is, can't we just honor wherever a woman is at? Like, can't we do that? But there became this strong emphasis of, if you're a woman, you should get married and have children. I'm not saying that's bad. I'm just saying, notice how you have to get married in order to live that happy, fulfilled life. And so purity culture, this, this idea, started in like the 80s and 90s. Some of you might remember this, not a ton of us, but um, there was the AIDS scare. Um, you know, after... Gosh, after the 60s, everybody doing free love came out of cost, right? So, you know, people start getting AIDS, and then people are like, oh, oh, no, this isn't good. People are going to be, our kids are going to die. Like, they're all going to die because they're, they're going to be doing this with each other, and they're going to get AIDS, and they're going to die. And so the government was concerned about that because, you know, Russia, um, they're like, if we don't have anyone around, we can't fight Russia. We only have nukes. Like, uh, that's, that's not good. Um, so they didn't want uh, people, their young people to die. And the church, rightly, goes, we don't want our kids to die. <laughs> Parents said the same thing. We don't want our kids to die. And, and so the U.S. government and the church, they started working against this kind of free love attitude. And so, and, and I would say this is always a dangerous thing with the, when the church and the government start doing things too closely, um, is the government, like, funded purity talks, abstinence talks. Do you remember these? Does anybody remember these? Okay. I was so glad I was homeschooled because uh, I did not have to endure these. Um, but basically, the thought was, okay, if you're the church... How are you going to convince a bunch of hormonal teenagers not to have sex with each other? How are you going to do that? It's a question I have all the time as a youth pastor. So this was, this was the messaging. Basically, I, this is hard for me to get through because to me it just sounds so funny. And I, I will only say this as your youth pastor as a parody, okay? But this is, this is what the language was, was sex is awesome, you should, you should have lots of sex. Sex is great. It's a good gift from God. And if you're going to have the best sex, you need to get married. And then when you get married, it's going to be the best sex ever. <laughs> There's so much wrong with that. <laughs> um, what, <laughs> this is definitely a PG-13 talk, just so if you weren't aware uh, at this point. <laughs> um, I've used the analogy when I've talked to people about this is like, if are you going to be that great at baseball if you never practice, you know? And then you get to the major leagues and you, you know you expect that you're just going to be great at this. Like, no, you're not. You're not going to be. It's you. It's not going to be good. Um, of course, that's not how this works, right? And and you know, if any of you have been raised to think this or you just absorbed it from Christian culture. Um, this isn't true. Uh, it's, it's just not. Like, yes, the, the ethical way of doing sex is within the marriage union. Yes. That does not mean that your sex life is going to be incredible as soon as you get married because you did it the right way. It's, that's not going to happen. And, and what's more, you will get mad at God if you experience the awkwardness that your, your first night is together, right? And, and you'll get mad at God, and you'll get mad at your spouse, and you'll get mad at yourself, and you'll think, what did I do wrong that I'm getting punished with this horrible sex life? It's like, no, you just got married. Just try to have fun. Um, so all of this led to uh, I think what's called the, pros if you've heard of the prosperity gospel before, this is the prosperity sex gospel, okay? And so the language is, okay, so you got this Christian dating couple, all right? 
if you've ever heard of I Chris I Kiss Dating Goodbye, uh, this is very much that. Um, so you got this Christian dating couple, and and then your rainbow bridge to the pot of gold on the other side is going to be by having the pure, like keeping your purity, keeping your virginity, and having all of these boundaries. And when you get married, it's just mind blowing sex. That that's what the language was. Okay, now. Remember, we're still talking about LGBTQ plus um, neighbors and such. And remember, 80% of them come from the church. So this is what they heard. So I'm attracted to the same sex. And what's the reward here for me to follow Jesus' commands about sexual ethics? Because by definition, I can't marry the person that I want to be with. And, and there, I, I went to a church, um, bigger church in, in Minnesota for a conference, and, and they have this coffee shop, and um, I'm walking by with some students, and there's this, all these big pictures in there. And one of the pictures is a Bible, and you've seen these cutesy where like the husband's ring and the wife's ring are sitting on the Bible and it like makes a heart with a shadow and stuff. Like it is one of those kind of pictures. And I, I turned to the students who were with me and I said, what do you think that that's communicating to all of the people that come to this church? Marriage is an ideal. You need it in order to be happy. You need to have sex in order to be happy. And all of our same sex same-sex attracted Christians who are in our churches are hearing this message, and the, there is nothing for them. You're supposed to follow Jesus' sexual ethics in order to get married, to have that pot of gold at the end. There's nothing that I can do, because by definition, I can't do that. That's what the Bible's telling me. This is what the Bible actually teaches, by the way. It's this next one. You have a Christian, you have purity, boundaries, and virginity because you're not married yet, and on, the pot of gold on the other side is submission to Jesus because Jesus is the point. Every single day, every single choice, every single attraction, every single desire, Jesus is the point. It is not to get anything else. It's not to get money. It's not to get power. It's not to get sex. It's not to get any of that. It's Jesus. If Jesus is not the goal of our discipleship and our obedience, then we are after another God. So, to summarize, the goal of biblical sexual ethics is not to have great sex because sex is not a necessary experience in life and God doesn't promise it to you. Don't take God's word and say, I was promised this when he never did. <laughs> Don't do that to him. You're going to get really mad at him for no reason. Um, submit yourself to Lord Jesus Christ. As we do this, we prepare our world and ourselves for the kingdom that Jesus is bringing and is already among us. Like, imagine what we can have in the church if we say, Jesus is the goal. If you're same sex attracted, then he's calling you to celibacy. Man, the, the witness that those people, our brothers and sisters who are same-sex attracted, can have for the rest of the church to push back against our idolatry, right? To say, no, you don't need sex in order to be happy. You don't need to have sex in order to be a fully alive human being. You don't need th these things. Like, that is an incredible testimony that we need to buy into and not keep perpetuating these myths about you need sex in order to be 